Good afternoon, everybody. So, um, first of all, I, I'm Paul Brindley from uh, Music Ally. This is uh, Michael Hubby from Sound Exchange. Um, and uh, first, I just want to say thank you to Medem for uh, inviting me here to, to interview Michael. Um, I was saying to Michael the other day when we had a little bit of a chat, uh, because I'm a little bit old, and I remember the days well before uh, the advent of Sound Exchange. And uh, so I used to be in a band called The Sundays, and we, were, we did okay in the US, and uh, we, did, we, we got a lot of radio play. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, this will be good, I'll be looking forward to my checks from, uh, from the radio plays. I wasn't one of the uh, songwriters. And then, uh, then I discovered <coughs> there's no money for radio plays in the US, and it was, just, it was quite an eye-opener, quite a, a thing to suddenly discover, you know, why. I mean, then, then I'd learned all about the, you know, the broadcast lobby and everything, but... Um, so I was really delighted when, uh, you know, I heard about the advent of this new body, and I guess, Michael, that's a good place to start, is just explaining, you know, who Sound Exchange is, where you do collect money, and where you don't collect sure. money. You forgot to talk about the check you first got and how it changed your life. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so Sound Exchange, hello everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks again for being here. Uh, Sound Exchange, uh, you know, we basically uh, do many things. You, sh you know, uh, I, we provide a lot of royalty solutions now, both in the sound recording and the publishing space. Uh, and we, we kind of do many different things in the industry to just try to make it work better on the back end. Uh, your question, I guess, was what do we collect for and what, what do we don't for? Well, yep. back then, when you got your for, first check, a lot of our growth um, uh, initially came from sort of internet radio, non-interactive internet radio, uh, going back 10, 15 years. Back when there were, you know, major internet radio players like AOL and Yahoo uh, on the scene. So uh, the bulk of what we collect uh, collected through the years has been non-interactive radio, but we do many more things now. We... Um, we help administer some direct deals from, that are done in the digital space. We do the back end of those direct deals. We help administer some big class action settlements. And we actually, um, we'll get into this later, we actually have now gotten into publishing and we, we uh, are involved in some publishing royalties up in Canada. So we have a lot of different revenue streams, a lot more than when you just got your first check. But the key thing being that it's, it, it's digital only and it's not the kind of, you know, where there are direct licenses between the rights owners and, and services. It's more for the sort of semi-interactive kind of... Right, uh, non-interactive, semi-interactive. Uh, we're, pr we're, we're pretty much only in the digital space. You're absolutely right that in the U.S. we have, um, on the sound recording side, we have a very sliver of a small section of neighboring rights, much less than the rest of the world, um, but that small section creates a lot of revenue. And... You know, I'm, I'm sure there, there might be some, uh, some artists, some labels here. Um, maybe just give us a, uh, just explain how you become a member of Sound Exchange. You know, is it about direct membership? Do you have to be a member via another society? Basically, uh, for Sound Exchange, if you, uh, if you have an interest in a sound recording, if you're an artist or a label, um, you, you can sign up to register. It's free. Uh, and we will pay you directly any of the money that we collect uh, over the course of, of the year. Um, we pay out very quickly. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but it's free to become a member, uh, free to sign up to register for U.S. royalties. And if you want to become a member and have us collect for you around the world, that's free as well. You can sign a membership agreement. We don't charge for any of that. And we, you can tap into our network. We have reciprocals with 40-plus uh, collectives around the world, collect, and we can collect for you on their behalf around the world. But if you've already signed up with another society who has a reciprocal agreement with you, then that's really how you're going to become a member. Is Absolutely. It? We also, yeah. you know, we work very well with uh, with a lot of other collectives. Many of them are, are here at Meet M. You'll, or you'll run across them. And uh, we obviously, uh, you can come into the system th through them as well. Um, uh, it's, there are a lot, of, a lot of ways to get into the system, but you should get into the system. There is money out there for really every artist or label that has uh, any play in the U.S. on satellite radio or internet radio. If, if you're in that, that system, you should be signed up with Sound Exchange one way or another, either through a, another collective or directly. Okay, and uh, it's, like I said, it's free. Membership is free uh, as well. And talking of getting into the system, how did you get into the system? How did you end up in this position? 
Well, uh, so um, I actually uh, am a lawyer by training, so I, was, uh, I, I did commercial litigation early on and then uh, did some, some work uh, with the Recording Industry Association doing I, as an IP lawyer uh, and came over to Sound Exchange. And then I've been the CEO there for uh, about 10 years. So I moved from the lawyer role into really the, you know, the, the, all the things the CEO does, right? You know, trying to pick a vision for the company, grow the business, uh, and it's been really exciting. I mean, the... In the ten or so years that I've that 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 in those ten or so years, for lots of reasons, um, the the growth has been kind of monumental. Um, when I first became, I actually, can probably have yep. a slide. You know, when I first became CEO, we were down in the paying out twenty, you know, twenty million or so. Um, and as you can see from the slide, last year we almost paid out one billion dollars, um, all primarily out of neighboring rights for that little sliver of rights. Um, you know. When you when when you all think of neighboring rights here in Europe, uh, you think about what's collected for the sound recording anywhere it's performed, right? Over the air radio and vent bars and clubs and venues and doctors' offices. We have none of that in the U.S. The only place we collect neighboring rights is this little sliver called digital. But that little sliver added up to almost a billion dollars last year. So it's uh, uh, just imagine what it would be if we had all those other rights. So, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, that's obviously a lot has come through the growth in services. But, I mean, have you actually, you know, have you expanded to take on many more services over the years as well? So it's not just that the fact that, you know, some of the major services are giving you more money. Right. You're picking up new entrants as well. Yeah, I mean, the growth, there's lots of reasons for the growth, um, some of which are going to be obvious to this audience. You know, the, one of the factors, streaming, which is, you know, where we, we, we get most of our revenue, Streaming is obviously the future. It's huge. In the U.S. last year, streaming was 75%, 75% of U.S. recorded music revenue. So that's part of what's driving this. Um, part of what's driving it is um, the growth in services. We collect from over 3,000 services every month. So every month, services send sound exchange royalties, and they send us data. We pay out every month. 90% uh, of the money we get is out the door within 45 days of receipt. We're very proud of that. That's, you know, that's a very quick payment rate. Um, and part of it's also, we do a lot to try to get creators paid. Sound Exchange at our core is just about getting creators fairly paid across the board. In so many instances out there, music is driving, you know, the, the creation of huge companies, immense wealth, right? Immense wealth out there for, and, and, and it's great to have these services, but the appropriate amount of money needs to work its way down to the creators. Um, and a lot of what we do is trying to make sure that creators are protected as much as possible, and we try to get them as fairly paid as, as we can. If, um, we'll talk about rates in a moment, but I, I just have to ask you about 2017, because, you know, that, that's the one bit that kind of goes down there. Then. Yeah, so there is, there is a dip in 2017. And, you know, mo most companies don't have a straight, straight up. Um, we had a little bit of dip because uh, there was some direct licensing involved with one of our biggest licenses. Pandora started to do direct licensing with, the, with some of the major labels in the big indies. So uh, the, the label portion then stopped going through us. But um, as you can see, we've, we've recovered uh, fine, and we're, we're closing in on a billion dollars. So... And I know that you wanted to, to talk about rates, and uh, this is a chart that shows a few, right, few it just jumps. An, and it's just an example. You know, you had asked um, what contributes to the growth. Why, you know, in, in any business, you don't typically have a, have a, a growth, a straight growth curve like, like we've had the good benefit of, of, of having, especially in the music industry, right? In the music industry over the past 15 years, a lot of the, a lot of the curves go the other way. So part, part of the growth um, is what we do to try to get creators paid. This is an example of one of our big licensees, um, Sirius XM, satellite radio in the US. We have an audio only, big audio only company in the US. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, called Sirius XM. It delivers just audio. Um, it's not like the Sky Network or something like that. And you know, you've got 35, 40 million people paying $14 a month you can do the math, that, that adds up to quite a lot of, of revenue. One of the examples of what we've done at Sound Exchange is make sure that they pay as fairly as we can and have them pay for the music, which drives the service. They have non-music channels, but without the music, the business model would fall apart. 
So this is an example of, over the years, the success we've had in getting the rates up, you know, starting down in the 2% range, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s. And with our most recent rate proceeding, uh, we got that, you know, all the way up to 15.5%. Now, you know, that is quite a jump. So, I mean, how did you manage to get such a big jump in one go? What were the arguments that you were able to employ that would justify such a... I mean, if I'm on the other end of that... Right. I'm going to be quite upset by that, by that, um, you know, that amount of a of a raise. I mean, well, um, I don't know if they were upset, you know. Um, <laughs> well, I'm sure they weren't best pleased. <laughs> we actually have a decent relationship with them, believe it or not. These these rate proceedings are minor little commercial disputes we have now and then. But you know, for a lot of our services, we deal with them all the time on an operational level. Um, we kind of view them in some ways as partners. If we want them to grow because that's good for us, it's good for the, the performers and the artists we represent, you know, a growing, healthy, vibrant uh, music system is, is good for everybody. And the arguments were, uh, you know, we, we basically just try to demonstrate the value of the music. And you can do that lots of ways. You can, um, you can use surveys. Uh, you can look at other places in the marketplace where they've negotiated for other content or even other music deals out there. So look at deals that were done in, in other digital services and, and you, you use that to show that they're, they were paying below what they should have. Um, so again, just an example of what we do to try to protect creators, to try to protect labels um, and make sure, and anybody involved in the process and make sure they're paid fairly. Well, you obviously won, won that one. Um, so now getting a little bit more onto the, uh, the main topic of, uh, of discussion here, and I just want to start on, on, on metadata, which is where I guess you know, everything sort of springs from ultimately. You still see so many articles these days. I, mean, I, I was reading one the other day when, when, when we chatted about you know, the amount of monies that are not being collected because of missing de metadata. I mean, how, how bad is it and why? Is it still so bad? We've been talking about this for a long time now. We have. It's um, so I've been in the industry over two decades. We, they were talking about it long before I came. Uh, and you know, I'll I'll just say it's uh, it's kind of a tragic that our industry doesn't have a better handle on who owns what. Um, you know, we sent a sent a person to the moon four decades ago, and we still don't know who write a, who wrote a song. Um, you know why it's so bad? Uh, I, I think there's lots of reasons. Um, first of all, the entire industry. Metadata wasn't as big a problem in the old days when you were dealing with, you know, a download or maybe, maybe a, uh, a, a, a CD or a song track where you had to get rights for 12, maybe 14 tracks. It was a challenge to get all the information, but you could do it. Uh, we all sort of struggled along and we figured it out eventually. Uh, but now when you have services that need to launch overnight and know tomorrow, you know, who owns 40 million or 50 million recordings and songs and who are the producers, it's a completely different um, task. So I think the scale of the digital world has brought the metadata problem to light. It was something we muddled through when you were, when, when you were dealing with, you know, releases or, or tracks even. Um, and it's, you know, it's the whole model was built around a sales system, which again, speaking of the US, it's not about sales as much anymore. It's about streaming. It's about the listen. Um, so that's, I think that's part of the reason it's been um, so problematic. And the other problem is there are lots of solutions out there, but unless we have a common, you know, you can have a great solution, but if enough people don't adopt it, if you have part, the, this group of parties who want to do metadata this way, and you have this group who want to do that way, you can't get a common solution if it's not common. So um, we need to think with one voice and speak with one voice. Which means that I have to bring up those dreaded three uh, letters that those of us, again, with slightly longer memories will, will know, uh, GRD, yes. um, which was not perhaps the industry's finest hour. Perhaps you'd like to just explain what it was and, and you know, perhaps why it, uh, it wasn't successful. Sure, uh, and, and we weren't really involved with GRD. I'm not the expert on that, but GRD, there have been many. Uh, GRD was an attempt by the, on the publishing community. This is the Global Rights The Global database. Rights Database. database yeah. uh, it was an attempt by the publishing community to create a global database, basically. Um, and I don't really know why it wasn't successful, to be honest. Um, there have been lots of attempts to do these collective solutions. Um, I mean, they spent, I don't know, tens of, tens of millions of euros on the GRD, all to no avail. Um, and that's, that's not helpful for anybody. 
Uh, there have been many attempts through the years, I mean, you know, on both the recording and the publishing side to, to come up with these databases. In the US, I will say, in the US, what SoundExchange has done is, um, you know, we, we sort of brought a lot of order to the sound recording side of the business, and we now have, in, in my opinion, the premier sound recording rights database in the world sourced from the rights owners, right? We get, we get, uh, we get data from the people that actually own the content. We require ISRC, which is, a, is a basically the serial number for a recording, um, and we've made that information publicly available just to try to make things work better, to remove friction. You know, uh, when I think of the industry, a lot of these metadata issues are like friction, right? They're drag on a, they're like drag on a car or plane, or they're friction in an engine, and they, they sort of hold back from doing all that we could do. And so one of what, part of what drives us at Sound Exchange is just removing friction, making things work better. We will offer things for free, you know, not, not necessarily even for our own benefit. If it helps all of our constituents just make the industry work more smoothly, we will do that. Um, and, uh, and it's important for everyone to have that attitude because data is not why anyone gets in the industry, right? People become performers like yourself or they, be, you know, they join labels or even the DSPs. It's all about the music, the creativity, providing a good customer experience, coming up with either finding great songwriters or a new model for a consumer. No one gets in this business to fill out, you know, uh, spreadsheets. Uh, unless or, they're a little bit weird. <laughs> unless they're a little bit weird. And yet, think how much effort goes into that exactly. My hope, my hope is that in 10 years, when we talk again at, at MeetM, in 10 years from now, that we're not even talking about this, that metadata is not even an issue. Because that's how it should be. It's not an issue in so many other industries. Well, what, what, what is going on right now then? What, what initiatives are you involved in that, that are making progress? Let's, let's be more optimistic. Sure, so um, we are heavily involved in DDEX. So DDEX is a, Explain DDEX. Is a digital, I was, I was gonna go there. It is a digital delivery exchange. It's a standard that a lot of entities in the industry, labels, publishers, songwriters, producers, performers, DSPs. It's a common way to convey data throughout the industry. And they have a whole host of different, um, different programs for whatever the purpose is. If you're, if you're a publisher and you want to notify people of a new release, um, you know, here's how you do it. And I do think that's, that is making progress. I think you know, DDEX has also been around for a long time. I see more and more entities adopting it, and that's moving in the right direction, right? It's, it's speaking the same language. It's making for seamless exchange of data. Um, so that's one example of, of, of one thing that's happening. I'll give you an example of what Sound Exchange has done. As I said, ISRC is the, is the um, uh, it's a sound recording code, international sound recording code. It was developed um, a couple decades ago, I guess, and it's supposed to be a serial number for, for a recording, right? So. You can use it to identify exactly who, who owns a recording and all the metadata associated with it. But there wasn't any place to go and look that up. So you, you have all these numbers out there that someone assigned, but that's kind of useless if they're not publicly available. So one thing we have done at Sound Exchange, we brought those tens of millions of recordings that we have with all ISRC and we have made them publicly available. If any of you want to know what an ISRC is for a recording or, or you have a you have the ISRC and you want to know uh, what's, what, what recording data is associated with it, you can go to our website, get it for free. We've developed APIs that we've provided to a couple dozen, sorry, um, automated interfaces. <laughs> Paul warned me not to use acronyms. It's very hard in this industry to talk and not use acronyms. Um, you know, an API is an automated interface uh, between, between a couple of programs. Uh, and we now work automatically with a lot of service providers giving them that, that, those ISRCs. So that's another example of advancement and removing friction and making things work a little bit and better. That, and that's about not being so possessive of, of, of the data, but I was gonna ask you, like, what, what else needs to happen so that we can get to a situation where we don't have to talk about this subject right. maybe in 10 years' time? What, what else needs to happen? Is well, it just about people being less possessive on the, the data that they own? or Well, that's certainly part of it. And don't get me wrong, some data is very proprietary and very possessive, right? If you're a record label, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to broadcast when your contract might be up with a particular performer. I mean, so some data should be closely held. 
But the first step is exactly, I think you hit the nail on the head. There has to be an attitude that, that all of this data is a tool. It's, it's to make the industry work better. You shouldn't be able to leverage your position because you have data that somebody else doesn't have. So that's, that's one thing I think that everybody has to do. Um, and I think, like I said, we need to migrate towards a common solution because if we're not all speaking the same language or using the same standards, then we're not going to get very far. You can't have little pockets using this solution and another pocket using a different solution. So um, I also wanted to ask you, I mean, there's a lot of, you, you know, startups coming up these days with solutions that mean perhaps we don't, we don't necessarily need so many intermediaries anymore. Um, and that might mean that you, as a society, get disintermediated because, you know, maybe there's, a, there's an easier way for people to collect money directly from services themselves. Do you feel at all threatened by what's going on, or do you think that that's... Uh, that's a bit, uh, you know, too much hype on that front. Um, I, I don't feel threatened. I mean, to be honest, uh, we're here so that creators get paid more accurately, more fairly. Um, you know, there are benefits to having collective action on certain things. But if there are solutions that, that advance that without needing CMOs, we're not in the business of just protecting our turf or protecting, um, you know, what we do. We, our board are the very people that we pay. That's true for a lot of the other uh, collectives out there. Uh, they wouldn't stand, nor would I stand, for just doing things to falsely uh, keep us propped up. Um, I do think we're a long way away from, from not needing, you know, from, there are people who talk about immediate real-time payments uh, directly without any other, uh, you know, any other structure, any other oversight. We're a long way from that, I believe. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe at a sort of complete level, but uh, at individual levels, it, it, it's, it's sort of beginning to happen. I wonder as well whether, though, actually that's kind of, has that sort of made you a little bit more entrepreneurial and thus, you you know, you've got moved into the publishing business and has that inspired you to sort of think, well, we can't just sort of stand still. We've, we've got to reinvent ourselves as well. Absolutely. We, um, we are very entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, for those of you that, you know, ever come to Washington, have the good fortune of coming to our office... We really, we really are more like a tech company, data services company. We think, um, we think about ROI. We think about leveraging our assets. We think about multiple revenue streams, and that's that's part of the reason we we moved into publishing. So we cut our teeth for the first 15 years on the sound recording side of the business. Uh, and when we think about the solutions that we brought to sound recording conduct in the U.S. and sort of the transparency and some of the order we saw an opportunity to maybe move into publishing and try to bring some of that, um, some of that energy and solution-minded approach to the publishing world. And the you publishers didn't get upset by this? No, well, the publishers, you know, any, I mean, we are providing a service. If we can provide a service that is uh, quicker, better, more transparent, again, think how quickly we pay out. We, like I said, we pay out every month uh, and faster than, you know, than a lot of entities in the industry. 90% uh, of the money out within 45 days. We have an ultimate pay through rate, 97, 98%. So that's, that's really good metrics. Those are really good performance points. And if you're a publisher or a record label or a songwriter or a producer, if there's an entity that can do something for you with a little more transparency and a little quicker, why not? You know? And especially if, again, part of the res remnants of the old model is we have all of, you know, all of these places you have to go to get what you need. The tech industry, there's people here from the tech industry, they, they rightfully um, look at all the places they have to go to get rights to, to launch their services. I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit imposing, right? And anything we can do to help make the, the data more centralized and more authoritative, uh, help make uh, streamline that type of data acquisition is good for everybody. It helps them launch new services. So uh, we, the publishers, I think we're happy that we, um, you know, we were another competitor coming to the game to try to, not competitor of theirs, but another entity just trying to provide services. So we're nearly out of time. I, I, I wondered whether we'd have time for questions, but I, I'm sorry about that. I don't think we are. I've got to ask you my last question, though, which is back to the beginning and the point about terrestrial uh, rights in the US and, you know, do you think that will ever change? Is there actually any possibility that that, 
finally there will be a terrestrial right for, for radio plays, for recordings in the US. Is that likely to change anytime soon? Well, uh, soon is a, is, a, is a relative term. Um, you know, we've been fighting this for decades as an industry, uh, and Sound Exchange has been directly involved for over 10 years trying to get commercial radio in the US to pay, pay for the recordings. Just to put it in perspective, commercial radio in the US makes $17 billion, $17 billion Yes, they sell advertising, but they draw the crowd with the music, and they pay exactly zero uh, to the performer of that music. So uh, we've, we've been in talks with them to see if there's a negotiated solution. Uh, those talks uh, sort of broke down last year. We're going to continue the fight. I'll be honest, you know, this year in Washington, D.C., I don't know if you've read, there's a couple things going on in Washington, D.C. that are distracting all of us, um, probably around the world. Um, uh, and there will be a terrestrial performance right at some point. Uh, for it's not sure. something that Donald is particularly sort of campaigning on then. No, although he should be because you know it's it's um, American artists not being rewarded the way that they should when they're, when their when their stuff is used. But look, we're going to keep fighting for that, and we do all sorts of other things, as I mentioned, to try to make sure that creators are paid. Whether it's trying to make sure we collect efficiently and pay out efficiently. Um, you know, our admin rate is 4%. That's, what it, that's all we take out of the revenue stream. Everything else goes out the door. So we always try to be efficient. We're constantly looking for areas to, um, to you know, get creators paid more. We're fighting to get the rates up. We're fighting in Congress on other issues to get them paid. Uh, we, just, we just helped pass, uh, us and uh, many other entities, pass this uh, huge legislation last year called the Mo Music Modernization Act in the US. And that did several things to advance the cause of creators and advance the cause of artists. Um, and we fought for that along with the rest of the industry and had a lot of success there. So we're going to constantly fight. You know, our driving force at the end of the day is to make sure that, that you know, creators that are underlying all of the wealth creation that I talked about earlier, make sure that creators are fairly paid. Well, Michael, Thank you very much. We are definitely out of time. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you can just give a big round of applause to Michael. Thank Huffy. you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.